All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Leonard, and I'll be your host for today. This evening, we have Tim Phillip, Head of Content from Prosperous. He'll be sharing five top metrics to identify within cloud stocks. So if you have heard, um, people are saying CJS Xiaomi is giving away a Tesla Model 3. Is that true? Yes. So for those who are not a customer of CJS Xiaomi, don't forget to scan a QR code, register, and my colleagues will get in touch with you tomorrow. For those who are already customers of CJS Xiaomi and Prosperous, don't worry. You are automatically enrolled into this program. And also, we are giving away 36 Apple products over this campaign period. This is until the end of this year. So you do stand a chance to win Apple products such as MacBook Air, iPad Air, and even iPhone 12. And for those who are tuning in today, you are able to learn, engage, and win. Yes, here are some of our July winners. As you can see, they won $50 Takashimaya voucher. And for those who are residing in Malaysia, we will be sending you grab food voucher for you to enjoy this. So now the question is, how are we going to engage? For those who are using your laptop or desktop to watch this session, there are buttons on your right, chat and Q&A. Don't forget to click on it and say hello for those who are customers of CGSMB. And for those who are new to us, just say hi. And for Q&A, don't forget to post your questions, vote them, and I will post this question to our speaker team tonight. Next slide. So before we get into the five metrics to identify the best cloud computing stocks, let me tell you three Fs about our speaker tonight, Tim. So the first F is that the first stock that he bought was HSBC. The first cut loss that he made was Lenovo and his favorite actor is Denzel Washington. So now I'm going to pass the time to Tim Phillip to share about the five metrics to identify winning cloud stocks tonight. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Leonard. Um, don't judge me for uh, HSBC. I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, I started my investment journey probably about 15, 16 years ago in my late teens. And, you know, I think investment is a, is a learning and discovery journey. So, you know, um, I do... I have learned a lot from uh, my mistakes in the past. So uh, thought I'd share that with you guys tonight. Um, before we move on, I just want to say everything in this webinar and what I'm going to say is all um, sort of my own personal opinion. It is not personalized financial advice. Uh, you know, the disclaimer there says it uh, just, just in case everyone um, is, anyone is wondering, compliance, uh, you know, obviously wants me to make that clear. So this is personalized financial, uh, not personalized financial advice. Please do your own due diligence, whatever names I do mention, um, you know, that's my own personal opinion. Um, okay, so I am from Prosperous. So what are we? We are actually a digital first um, sort of uh, investment app on the go. Uh, we have an app on Android and iOS. So, you know, check us out, uh, download us. We have a build and boost application. So we actually um, are multi-asset and multi-exchange uh, across, you know, 16 or 18 different uh, markets. Uh, we have lots of different assets that you can trade. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, in individual stocks, ETFs, uh, different exchanges. And now we offer also China A shares as well. So that's uh, something you should uh, check out uh, uh, with, with Prosperous. Um, okay, so experience life while investing. This is our campaign to help, uh, you know, to get people involved in uh, in the Prosperous brand. We're going to give away free curated experiences. So if you've ever been to Atlas, you know that they have a gin and a martini tasting there. You can go check that out as well as, um, you know, uh, spinning and you can also do wheel throwing. So there's lots of different range of activities. So uh, please do uh, so sign up for that and check it out. And then obviously, as, as um, Leonard was saying, you trade with Prosperous as well. We're also included in the CGS CIMB uh, Driven to Do Better campaign. So, um, you know, if you are, if you do want a Tesla, who doesn't want a Tesla, then please do, um, do get onto Prosperous and, uh, and start, uh, start investing. Okay. 
And finally, sorry, I've got to plug our upcoming webinar. I'm doing one today, tonight. I'm also doing one on Thursday. Sorry, I don't know why it's moving. Um, so understanding risk and volatility in portfolios. I think this is something that's really interesting for you know, anyone who's under sort of gone through a lot of volatile periods in the market. You know, you have to understand your own personal behavior, uh, as well as understanding the risk that you're taking on when you do invest. So please sign up uh, via the QR code if you want to hear myself speak and also Jake, who is a portfolio manager with our private wealth team in CGSCIB Securities. I'll be hosted by Crystal, who's our prosperous community manager. Okay, so I'm going to get onto the nitty gritty of this, uh, this presentation, which is the cloud, right? So what is the cloud and why is it exciting? So I think first off, we have to understand what the cloud market is, right? So if you look at the cloud computing market, the traditional cloud is actually the sort of infrastructure as a service. So if you think about SaaS, uh, you know, everyone talks about SaaS and then PaaS, and then, uh, you know, there, there's all the AAS, which is as a service, which basically means it's a subscription model, or it's provided on a regular basis. Um, if you think about the actual infrastructure of it, the actual building blocks of the cloud, that's the infrastructure as a service. And that is the traditional market, which is dominated by the big players like Microsoft and Amazon with uh, AWS and you know Microsoft with Azure and Google with Google Cloud. So what they're providing is a service to access uh, you know, computing power in the cloud. You don't have to have on-site servers. Um, you don't have to have expensive maintenance to, to, to keep that up and to keep upgrading it. So it's actually um, the building blocks and the infrastructure of the cloud effectively distributed uh, via these, these large players. So that to me is obviously, I think, a really well-known market opportunity that you know, everyone's quite aware of. If anyone owns Amazon or Microsoft, these are uh, mega cap names that are worth one to two trillion dollars. So they're huge. So if we look at the the other side of that, there's also the uh, platform as a service, which is looking at specific uh, platforms that offer uh, services like communications, uh, like Twilio. So that offers a, a platform where you can communicate with your, uh, with your market or with your users and your client base. Um, but what I'm going to be covering today is SaaS, which is software as a service, which I think everyone will have heard of. You know, it's the most common, it was the most exciting, I think, area of the uh, cloud computing market. Uh, and, the, you know, the cloud computing market itself is expected to be worth uh, around 830 billion by 2025. Um, so KGAR about 14.2% between uh, now and uh, 2025. And actually the SaaS market itself is going to be worth around 310 billion by 2026. Uh, and last year it was worth just over 150. So you're looking at a doubling of the SaaS market in about five to six years. So there's a huge market opportunity uh, and this is a global phenomenon, but obviously right now, I think it's a bit more focused in the US because that's where the opportunities are in the listed space. Um, but definitely keep an eye out for China because I think in China, the SaaS market is actually at a very, very nascent stage at the moment. And um, you know, what with this move towards uh, subscription billing and, uh, you know, enterprise, which is basically B2B. So if you think about business to consumer, that's something like what a Tencent or an Alibaba would offer, but a business to business enterprise uh, product is something such as a Microsoft would offer, right? Like Microsoft Word or what I'm using right now, PowerPoint, that's something that businesses would buy from another business such as Microsoft. So I think when you think about that market opportunity, it's already big and growing in the US, but in China, it's, it's actually really uh, not even started. So it's actually a really exciting opportunity um, that will probably flourish in the next five to 10 years. Um, so how did it start, right? So the SaaS business model is really a win-win. Um, if you think about the pioneers in the SaaS market, you can actually identify salesforce.com. Uh, that was probably one of the first sort of pioneers in understanding how the business model works. Uh, that was founded by Mark Benioff, who's still at the, at the helm today of Salesforce. And you, as you, you know, if anyone's not aware, Salesforce is, you know, sort of a $250 billion company now. So it's huge. Um, it's sort of a tier two uh, tech firm. It's, it offers enterprise software. It competes with Microsoft and a lot of the, um, you know, customer relationship uh, software it has uh, anyone who's dealt with, you know, customer management has probably used Salesforce. 
Uh, it's a widely used tool nowadays, and it's and they were one of the first pioneers to understand the benefits of uh, of software as a service. So, I mean, there's a quick list here, but for for starters, you know, spilling your customer on a regular basis, either monthly or annually, that uh, gives you a lot of revenue visibility, right? Whereas if you have a one-time fee with traditional software, which you used to have, that would only give you lumpy revenue, and then you wouldn't be sure when you would have another stream of revenue coming in. So understanding how to distribute the software remotely via the cloud and then getting a regular fee for it is you know, a no brainer. It helps everyone in terms of the, the business who's charging it because it gives you revenue visibility, but also it gives a client the flexibility to upgrade or to downgrade how many they, um, the plan that they want to be on, or if it's a regular monthly subscription or annual subscription, the cost isn't going to be so humongous to them. So it's not going to be a massive one-off cost. Um, and scalability, right? I mean, that's another advantage of this, this whole business model is the incremental uh, profit that you make from, the ex from any extra sale is basically all profit. So if you think about maybe an Apple iPhone, which is a hardware, it's hardware, right? It's a piece of um, it's a it's a phone which is has to be manufactured, so there is cost that goes into manufacturing the extra iPhone, and then obviously to distribute that iPhone and to sell that iPhone, it, it takes marketing dollars and it takes uh, labor. If you think about SaaS, which is just basically a piece of software, um, as soon as you've got that piece of software and built it and got it to a scale where it starts to be profitable, every extra sale. Um, that you make of that software is in the cloud, right? It's basically going to be all profit because as soon as you reach scalability, that allows you to distribute it basically um, cost-free. So I think that's another thing that has really sort of struck home with investors is just how profitable these businesses can be um, and, you know, how high their, uh, their profit margins are over time. Um, and, you know, the free trials, again, that's a massive, massive uh, benefit of SaaS. You can try it out. You can see how it goes. If you go to any sort of, uh, if you go to any SaaS service online, if you go to say, I don't know, DocuSign, or if you go to uh, an Okta, you can always have a free trial. Or if you go to Atlassian, you can have a free trial for the, you know, their software tools and see if it works. If, it, if you like it, then you can sign up. And so it's a great model to get people in, to get people using it, uh, and then to, to hook them and uh, hopefully have them sticky in your, in your ecosystem. Okay, so it's still in the early stages. So this is something that I think people don't uh, maybe fully appreciate. They think SaaS is, uh, is you know, obviously, obviously it's big and it's massive and, you know, everything's, oh, it's uh, super expensive and how much more growth is there, right? So this is actually a CIO survey from the second quarter of this year. So this is Morgan Stanley does this uh, every quarter. So the CIO is the chief information officer of you know, large corporates. So this is a survey of large CIOs, uh, corporate, large corporates CIOs in the US. Uh, and it looks at the total in terms of the application workloads um, you know, from, from the public cloud uh, and on-premise total uh, as opposed to managed hosting and co-location. As you can see, you know the cloud is still a is still a minority uh, compared to on premise, um, and so that's going to be beneficial to all the, obviously the Amazons and the Microsofts. But trickle down effect that will also benefit SaaS, right? Because there are going to be companies in the SaaS ecosystem that are going to be able to offer these services via the cloud, uh, and these workloads are going to shift more and more to the cloud over time because it's been proved you know over the past 10, 15 years that on premise. Uh, hardware and then on-premise software is just is just a waste of money and it's also way too expensive to maintain and so there are lots of downsides to that so you're going to see this shift continue over time um, and that's going to benefit SaaS stocks for sure okay so I'm going to move on to key metrics to watch and so let me just be clear in this section this is all growth right so I mean when you talk about growth stocks this is something where they operate in, you know, high revenue growth, high um, sort of uh, high TAM markets where there's a lot of opportunity to grow over time. Um, and SaaS stocks do tend to be volatile. So that's something you do have to keep in mind when you do invest in SaaS stocks is there's a lot of volatility to contend with. 
Um, and a lot of things hinge maybe on shorter term outlooks, um, you know, their evaluation. So every individual SaaS stock obviously has its own story. So you definitely do need to, to understand the business um, that you are investing into. But let me start with the basics, right? So revenue sales growth is the easy one. That's the top line. Uh, that's the top line figure that you're going to be looking at in terms of how, um, how analysts or how the market's going to be pricing the, uh, the company. Um, it gives you also an idea ability idea of the ability of the company to actually drive uh, the business over time and what is the normal range right so i think you kind of need to understand what is the normal range of growth for a stock in this in this sector or this area versus its competitors so there's no point maybe comparing a uh, sort of maybe a shopify versus like a CrowdStrike because they're totally different um, sectors right one is working in e-commerce or e-commerce SaaS, and then one is in uh, is in cybersecurity SaaS. So I think you have to understand how your um, how the competitors are placing against against uh, the SaaS stock that you're trying to invest in. But this right hand side is just an example of the kind of growth rates that you kind of see in in SaaS stock. So this is Shopify from uh, Q2, and that's uh, you know look sort of looking at a sixty percent uh, year on year in the latest quarter. Um, obviously, that's been boosted by the pandemic, but this is a company that has been, you know, easily growing at sort of 50, 60, 70% over the past uh, four or five years since it went public, right, in about 2016. So I think finding the best in class SaaS stocks, you really need to have the sales growth that continues and is maintained. Um, if that sales growth does start to tail off, then you can expect the share price to get hit um, quite hard because that is, that's, I think, it's one of the first things that they do look at. Um, but obviously they do need to management does tend to indicate or guide, you know, revenue growth throughout the upcoming quarters as well as the upcoming fiscal quarter. So that's definitely something to watch. Um, but revenue sales growth is probably the bait that, you know, the first base that you go to when you look at um, a SaaS stock and its growth potential. Okay. So number two, um, gross profit margin. Uh, so this is basically the revenue that the company is generating minus the cost of goods sold. So the cost of goods, what is that? That's basically um, basically labor as well as any capital expenditures, right? It doesn't include overheads like rent or like R&D or marketing, all that other stuff. So it's really a very crude metric of profit, but it does give you a good um, overview of how profitable could this be if they get everything, all the other costs in order and they start producing, you know, profit margins on the operating side, um, as well as the net profit side. And it does show you how much of, you know, each dollar in sales that uh, the company can retain as gross profit. Uh, and obviously in SaaS, you are looking at higher gross margin businesses, just in the nature of uh, how they generate their dollars. So if you're looking at something like a, I don't know, like an Okta, which is in cyber, which is in security uh, and identity uh, SaaS, that's, you know, got a gross margin of somewhere in the region of 75 to 80%. And so this is quite a common thing, whereas, you know, if you're looking at, um, I don't know, say supermarket operators, uh, you know, they, they can be, they're super thin, thin margins, right? They're like sort of five to 10%, you know, on a, on a gross basis, maybe, or maybe 15%, but on a net basis, it's, it's really, it's really small. So if you're looking at gross margin, these SaaS stocks have the potential to be up there in the 70 to seventies to eighties. Um, but that's definitely a, a number that you should watch because if it is in the seventies or eighties, which is obviously the higher quality businesses that you're looking for, that's a good sign. Um, if they can maintain that margin as well. Okay, uh, number three. So TAM, everyone's probably heard of this, growing total addressable market. Uh, this is basically just an estimation by the company or third parties of how much potential revenue can, they, can this company generate from the market that they operate in, right? So does it operate in a massive market? Here is an example of um, cybersecurity. So this is CrowdStrike's uh, own sort of estimate using IDC data. Uh, and you can kind of see that the spend for IT security is just way below what it should be. Um, and they're kind of seeing that IT spend uh, for cybersecurity will go up or for cloud security will go up. So the opportunity there, as sort of outlined by IDC, is that right now, 
way too many companies are spending too little on cybersecurity, and there's obviously a massive uh, demand for it, and IT budgets in future will, will reflect that. So you're kind of seeing what, what is the scale of that opportunity, and can it keep growing over the long term? So it's one of those where I think if you understand the optionality that a company has, so for example, can this company move into other adjacent markets and make its TAM bigger, then that is going to give the company a, a premium valuation, or it's going to give the company a bit more of a leg up over its competitors. Uh, what I find for a lot of SaaS stocks is it, you know, does it have the first mover advantage, which I think is really important in, in the SaaS market because it has that brand recognition, uh, probably the trust as well of, of users and clients. Um, and it has that, it has that head start, I guess, on, on generating um, recurring revenue as well as generating uh, use like a user growth, strong user growth. So I think that's something. Um, if they can execute well, then a first mover advantage usually uh, usually leads to finding really successful SaaS stocks. Um, moving on to the optionality part, I think this perfectly illustrates um, Shopify. So Shopify, if anyone's not really aware, is sort of a e-commerce SaaS stock. So what it does is it's basically the brains behind the online store. So it helps merchants build an online presence. Um, it helps them, you know, process payments. It helps them fulfill orders. It helps them with marketing. It helps them with SEO. It helps them with basically everything that you can think of if you're thinking uh, about e-commerce from a merchant's perspective, so from selling. So if you actually think this, this is um, competing with Amazon, it's actually not. It's actually not nothing to do with, with Amazon. It's actually just providing the tools for merchants or for small and medium businesses to actually sell their goods and their wares online themselves without having to go to an Amazon, without having to go to a third party marketplace, right? So they can actually build their own narrative the way they want to, they can build the brand that they, the way they want to. So it gives them a lot more control. And so what you're seeing is this, that this is something that's really struck a chord with a lot of merchants and they like this. And you can kind of see the timeline of Shopify, you know, started out uh, by Toby Lutke, who was, um, basically a German in, in Canada and he was a big snowboarder, but he didn't, he realized that you couldn't actually buy a snowboard online. And that was, you know, a problem that he felt was, he was kind of wanted to solve. And so from that was born Shopify where, you know, you could, you could build your own shop online. And so throughout its, throughout its journey, it's actually managed to move into different areas of, of um of the SaaS market or from this from the perspective of recurring revenue it's managed to get new marketing dollars or it's managed to add you know payments into its process processing a few years ago it bought a logistics firm so it's helping merchants fulfill orders and and you know sort of moving into that logistics space as well so i think the optionality is a key driver for the growth of these companies if they can stay on top and then they continue to grow uh, and find new market opportunities that obviously will increase your TAM. And if you can do it profitably, or if you can do it um, sustainably, I think that's a key. So I think this is a perfect example of a SaaS stock that's actually been able to grow its TAM over time by moving into different verticals uh, and exposing its exposing the, I guess, inefficiency in those verticals and then offering a, a product that the client and the user really, really wants in the end and is willing to pay for as well, which is crucial. Okay, so number four is actually a measure of customer spend. So I think this is a bit more of a technical term that is primarily used with SaaS stocks just because it has that, um, it resonates with people who are looking at investing in SaaS. And it's a good, it's a good base, uh, pun the pun, to start with looking at the stickiness, uh, the stickiness of a, of a product. And so this is called the dollar base net retention rates, which is, you know, obviously shown to DBNRR. Um, and for example, here, this is DocuSign, which is uh, obviously a, the e-signature, but also smart agreements, uh, SaaS company. And you can see, you know, over time, it's managed to grow its net dollar retention. So what is the net dollar retention? So basically it takes a look at if, they didn't grow their customer base. So their customer base stayed at the level that it was, say, you know, in Q4 F, uh, or Q1 fiscal year 22. Um, how much more money are they making from those customers if they just gain no new customers? 
and it's 125%, which means 100% means they're making exactly the same amount of money. Um, 125% means they're making 25% more from those customers than they did um, you know, previously in, in the prior 12 months, trailing 12 months. So it's a good measure of understanding the spend that the, that the SaaS company or the SaaS stock is able to generate from their existing customers. So ideally, you want it to be obviously over 100%. If it's below 100%, it, it tends to mean that the company is not really that sticky or is not offering a, a service or a product that clients are willing to pay more for or continue to pay for. So that look that seems to be like this churn in the customers or the customer spend. So ideally, you obviously want it to be over 100. There are uh, metrics in terms of what is the median. There's some good data out there to understand the range of the DBNRR. Um, this is a great this is a great um, resource which is uh, which is online. It's a great uh, tech analyst who does a sort of a breakdown, a detailed breakdown of all the uh, dollar based net retention rates of the SaaS universe in the US. Um, and you can kind of see in the latest quarter uh, or the April quarter end rather, the median's around 120. So I think a base of 120 is what you want as as uh, the minimum for something, you know, a, a high a sort of a high quality uh, SaaS stock. Um, and if you're looking at Snowflake on the left, that's, you know, obviously in, insane, but it's also in its early stages of growth. So you should kind of understand where in the growth cycle these companies are. I think Snowflake is quite a young company. It's probably in sort of like five, year five or six of its, of its um, growth. So you're, you're, you'll tend to see a lot of uh, high DBNR numbers in, in younger companies, but if they can continue to post numbers in the 125 to 130 or above 130 and they're older companies, then that's a good sign that this product is sticky and that people are willing to pay for it. Um, and that's obviously gonna benefit the, the company's uh, top line and the share price, right? So this is a metric that a lot of SaaS investors uh, tend to focus on as well when they look at, um, when they look at the, the viability of, of SaaS stocks uh, to invest in. Okay, and then finally, I'm going to round out with international growth. So I think this is something which doesn't really get enough attention um, because the U.S. is such a massive market anyway that no one really cares or maybe no one really notices if they're growing internationally or in Asia or in Europe. Um, everyone's super excited about the, the domestic opportunity in the U.S. It's so huge and cloud computing so massive. But actually, revenue growth outside the U.S. can be really sizable. So this for example, at Zoom, which is, you know, video communications, uh, a SaaS, SaaS communication stock in the video in uh, the communication space. Um, and this is an area that they've really managed to carve out, obviously, with the pandemic headwind. I mean, the pandemic obviously gave them this, this turbo boosted uh, growth. But I think the spend uh, of international markets is still relatively small as compared to the US or the Americas, right? So, I think there's an underestimation of how much growth potential there is outside the US and how much demand there is for these services outside the US. Because if you think about the tech ecosystem, you have the US and then you have China. Um, China tech and China enterprise level software is not really used globally, whereas US enterprise level software is always used, you know, is basically ubiquitous. If you think of Microsoft or Salesforce or um, you know, DocuSign, these things are used uh, internationally or Zoom. Um, these things are used everywhere, uh, except maybe by China because China has its own ecosystem. But outside of that, it's basically they have the whole market to themselves or in, a, in effect, they have limited competition from giants in Europe because Europe doesn't really have tech giants in the same way that the US does. So I think if you think about the market opportunity internationally, there's a lot of demand for these types of services in Europe and also obviously in Asia. Um, outside of China, there's a huge demand for, for you know, video communications like Zoom or, or um, CRM software like uh, that, that Salesforce uses. So these are tools that we're all familiar with and we, we use maybe on a daily basis, either through work or in a personal capacity. And so the opportunity to grow internationally, um, you know, shouldn't be underestimated, I think. Um, and so Netflix is a classic early stage example of this. This isn't actually a SaaS stock, but I mean, this is a maybe a classic example of, of analysts or the market underestimating how much potential there is outside the US. So a lot of times previously, 
Netflix might fall because US subscriber numbers, you know, fell short of expectations. And then there'd be like, you know, there'd be a big debate about whether they're going to be able to keep this up and with the US and there's all the focus on the US. Uh, and then slowly over time, that's obviously changed, right? So, I mean, it previously made up about 70%. If you look at, you know, the right-hand side here, Q2 in 2016, um, the U.S. as a total of uh, revenue, U.S. streaming, it probably made up, yeah, about 60, uh, about 70%. But then if you think about it today, Q2 2021 here, which is looking at, you know, how it's expanded into new markets, you can kind of see Netflix used to only break out international, and now they're breaking it out by region like EMEA, LATAM, and APAC. And you can see how much more of an impact those international markets are starting to have um, on subscriber numbers, but also on revenue for, for Netflix. So at the moment, I think it's around 46, 45, 46% from the US and Canada, uh, as opposed to you know, 70% or so five years ago. So you're kind of seeing that shift and that diversification away from the US because Again, this is a net, this is Netflix, which is a ubiquitous service, which everyone now has and everyone can access. Um, this is obviously not as cloud stock, but it's just an example, I think, of how we can understand the growth opportunity for these best in class, um, these best in class SaaS stocks, and if they have the opportunity to grow internationally uh, and take market share in different countries, because there is there is money willing to be spent outside the US on these on these SaaS, on these SaaS services uh, they just need to find the right product market fit and the right um, and the right uh, I guess pitch for the local market but they tend to um, if they're compelling enough they'll they'll be able to attract users in international markets okay so that for me is the end I kind of wanted to leave a bit more time for Q a actually so I didn't want to bore you to death with loads of slides um, but before I do go, Oh, sorry, before I move on to q and I do want to plug a couple of upcoming sessions that we have uh, for Prosperous. I already mentioned risk and volatility uh, on the left-hand side, which you can see, which is on Thursday. But um, I also want to talk about SREITs. So we'll be having myself uh, and Seboon, who's um, our chief investment strategist from CGS CIME Securities, um, talk about SREITs. And, you know, I think there's a demand for income in today's environment and it's something that's been around for, you know, ever since REITs went public here. It's a really popular form of investing in real estate. Um, and we kind of want to share our thoughts on what makes a great REIT, understanding the sectors, you know, metrics to focus on. Uh, and also, of course, why yield isn't, you know, the end of the world or isn't the be all and end all when you invest in a REIT. There is there are lots of other things to think about uh, besides yield. So uh, please do sign up on the QR codes with those two, uh, those two upcoming sessions. Uh, and I think I'll move to the q and if we have any. All right. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, we do actually have uh, five questions. So let's just jump right in. Uh, I think the first question that we received is actually, investors are leaving cloud stocks for a cheaper legacy enterprise play, like some of the stocks that you just mentioned, Snowflake, DocuSign and all. And then yep. there, there is an article that's saying that they are leaving out from all these things and going into stocks such as IBM, HP, and all, due to yeah. two things. Uh, the first one, I think the valuation it's trading at much lower, and second yeah. is the reopening play. So, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think I would I would agree on the short term. I think there is obviously um, a rotation back into the whole you know value, but if you're thinking about the longer term and not timing the market, which is which is what I try not to do, then I think it becomes a bit more of a of a structural story where you think about where would you see these businesses maybe in five years. Um, and I think most most of us would, would would agree that I think SaaS is more likely to be the dominant model in five years time rather than maybe you know the legacy like Cisco or Oracle or IBM. Um, and are they going to be able to turn around their businesses, right? Because I think at this level, you know, say in Intel, I mean, that's just in the chip industry, but that's, you know, that's been uh, highlighted, I guess, as a turnaround story. But there has to be a lot that has to go right for that company to turn everything around because it's, you know, it's really gotten itself into a hole. Um, 
you know, revenues are falling. They're kind of thinking about opening up foundry, you know, foundry again, spinning out a foundry and doing it, doing it themselves. So I think there is lots of question marks over strategy for these types of businesses. If you think about the valuations, I would agree. I mean, there are some really, you know, um, there are some outrageous valuations in the market, but I would also caution that just because the valuation is high doesn't mean um, doesn't mean that it will automatically you know tank. I mean, everyone for years was saying Amazon is way too expensive, um, and look where that is today, right? In terms of has it been able to sustain its growth? Has it been able to expand into new markets? Has it been able to surprise to the upside? Uh, consistently it has been able to do that right so i think it depends on what is the price that people are willing to pay so i think valuation is a very subjective term um but i do agree in the short term you know i think say Boone has mentioned this previously um you know i think he sees it as a uh you know there's the rotation back into value but then if the delta variant um sort of gets worse then i think tech the tech pandemic plays might come back but it's more a question of where do you see these stocks in sort of uh, three, five, 10 years? And I think that for me is, is still a very compelling growth story. All right, since you are talking a little bit about uh, growth and also longer duration investing. So there's mm. a question a little bit towards REITs. They yeah. are center REITs. So right. with the growth and the demand in cloud scene and all, would it be safe to say that we will potentially see an explosive growth in DC REITs? Um, I think I think you're already seeing some some growth in um, in the re- the DC REIT space in Singapore. If you're talking about the US, there's already quite a few established names there like Equinix and Digital Realty Trust. Um, and they've obviously kept up with um, you know the the data center growth market. So they already quite well established in that in that space. Um, I think there will be more listed DC REITs. I don't know if it will be too saturated because I think um, DC is, is, you know, there are lots of different models to it. There's like co-location and then there's, you know, single tenant. So you have to understand the tenant structure and uh, I guess the, the lease structure. A lot of them are maybe not freehold. So that's something as well that you need to be aware of. If it's a freehold structure, what is the you know, the weighted average lease expiry, all these things come into, into play. Um, I think Asia's definitely got more scope to grow its REIT market. Um, you know, Singapore's obviously become a hub for, uh, for some data centers. I think Hong Kong is, you know, starting to build more data centers as well. But I think there's definitely scope um, for more data center REITs to, uh, to go public. I just don't know if it will be here or if in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. already has a well-established data center read market and in Singapore you're talking like Keppel DC and Maple Tree Industrial I think the really the only two with with data center read exposure um, but they're both you know obviously have done well and I think they're on a, a good um, structural story but the yields are obviously a bit less compelling if you're looking at yield but um, it, it matters on the quality side so yeah I, I think there is definitely there's definitely room for for more data center reads to, to go public. All right, thanks, Tim, for that. Um, now, the third question is towards China. Hmm. So this may be a little bit tricky. So I think the first one is uh, a little bit something like stocks such as Kingsoft Club. So with yeah. the whole delisting risk and all, uh, what's your stand on this? That's the first. And the second question here is that with China's crackdown in terms of the school tutoring, healthcare, e-commerce, how would this impact cloud demand? Right. Okay. So I think first question on the, on the ADR side. So the American depository receipt side, which is the U S listed Chinese stocks. Um, if you're talking about King soft cloud, that's uh, KC, if I, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, I think there, obviously there are solid companies, right. And they're listed in the U S I mean, personally, I wouldn't buy any U S listed Chinese stocks just because of, um, disagreements between the SEC and then obviously Chinese regulators. Um, you know, there's talk of the VIE structure. I think that's probably uh, secondary to 
what the SEC is doing in the US, which is start to scrutinize these Chinese companies more in terms of um, are they allowed to access their books? Or are they allowed to audit them? And you know, they basically um, hadn't done that for years and let, let it go. But then now you've seen a bit, a few more scandals like Luck and Coffee, and then you've seen this crackdown and things get wiped out. Um, and so I think the regulators are starting to align a bit more with the government in terms of cracking down on China. And so what the consensus is, I think, is that you will not see many ADRs listed in China from Chinese stocks in the future. They'll be listing in Hong Kong or Shanghai or Shenzhen, um, raising money in local, in, you know, in uh, the home markets. Uh, and then you also have, I mean, the delisting risk, to be honest, is quite small. And if it does happen, I think you'll get a lot of advanced notice. But I personally wouldn't want to be holding any ADRs in, um, in the US just because of the disagreements over the over the regulatory um, the regulatory sort of picture there, just because you know you've heard a few comments from the SEC uh, chief Gary Gensler talk about retail investors getting hit hard and um, you know losing money through this Chinese crackdown and also through other various uh, maybe scandals such as Luck and Coffee. So I think there is a resolve there to hold Chinese companies to account and hold them to the same standards as I guess every other company. So I think there's this bipartisan agreement between Republicans and Democrats that Chinese companies should be held to account in the US markets if they're going to operate there. Um, and so that just gives them a bit one more shove to go back to China, right? Because there was already Chinese regulators not happy with them listing in the US. I mean, DD, you saw that that was, you know, a, a scandal. Uh, and then that's just that's just pushing them back to China from the US end and also from the Chinese side as well, right? They want, the Chinese government wants these companies to be listing um, back home and, and revealing what they're, um, you know, disclosing data about listing back in their home markets. Because I think there's a misconception that the US offers higher protection to investors and there's more disclosure, but actually Hong Kong didn't allow Didi to list or there were question marks around DD's data privacy before trying to list in Hong Kong, uh, according to Bloomberg, and then they went to list in the US because it was easier. So I think there's going to be um, there's going to be a reckoning for those names in the future. So I think it's better to to be a, just I guess better safe than sorry and just not not be involved in ADRs in uh, in the US and stick to Hong Kong or, or A shares because I think that's the um, that's the safer safer uh, area. And then, sorry, what was the second question? I got so caught up in that one. All right, don't worry about it. Um, so the second question is more towards the crackdown, home right. tutoring, healthcare, oh, e-commerce. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so the cloud market, um, I don't think it's going to affect it that much, to be honest. Um, it, you know, I, I don't know the stats specifically on what percentage uh, these education companies use in terms of cloud bandwidth or cloud uh, data, but I can't imagine it being a massive amount. If you think about the growth or potential growth of these um, of these enterprise services in China, which are already so small, um, then I think there is massive, massive potential to use cloud bandwidth on other things. You know, for example, there are loads of there are companies doing uh, like SaaS marketing in payments. There are companies doing enterprise SaaS. Uh, listed in Hong Kong. So I think there are, you know, there are lots of opportunities for these companies to grow bigger and to also align with the Chinese government's 2025 plan or 14, five, 14 uh, five year plan, which is, you know, obviously I think with a falling um, birth rate and aging demographics in China, I think one of the priorities for the government in China is actually to increase productivity because one of the things that really plagued Japan is that they're an aging demographic country, but productivity didn't really catch up or didn't really um, make up for the shortfall in the birth rate. So I think the Chinese government understands that for the gov for the economy to continue to grow, they can't just keep pumping investment dollars into, you know, I don't know, like the 10,000th airport or, you know, another 50,000 kilometers of track, like train tracks. They actually need to invest in productivity growth of the labor force. And one of the key re roots of that is going to come from software, right? It's going to come from enterprise software. It's going to come from um, the cloud. 
So I think that's a key area where there's going to be some alignment with the government where they do want enterprise SaaS level, enterprise level SaaS to start helping businesses, you know, obviously um, deliver better services, but also deliver it at a cheaper cost, cheaper unit cost. And obviously, you know, all these types of tools that enterprises use on a daily basis in the SaaS world, they improve productivity. So I think that's going to align with, um, with what the government wants to do in China. All right. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, I think the last two questions uh, that we have, uh, the fourth would be, uh, is the current semiconductor stock such as NVIDIA, AMD, Broadcom, it's going, squeeze is going to affect the demand for the cloud data center and all? And how can investors protect themselves from this kind of risk? Um, you mean the semiconductor shortage? Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think the problem with the data center, um, I think the problem with the shortage is that it's coming from the foundry side, right? So it's the supply chain. So the problem is really rooted with, with the Asian companies like Samsung or TSMC, which they just haven't really been able to keep up with demand. And I think this was something that they had admitted themselves well, TSMC had anyway, is that when the pandemic hit, they assumed demand would plummet. And so I think, you know, they hadn't really kept high levels of inventory or they, they kind of were not ramping up production. And so they were caught quite short, uh, sort of flat footed in terms of the surge in demand for chips, um, for everything. Uh, and obviously data center chips, um, gaming chips, you know, they're sort of the cutting edge one, the cutting edge chips that TSMC and Samsung are producing. Um, and so I think that's really been the bottleneck for these companies like NVIDIA, um, for uh, AMD, because they're using, they're using obviously TSMC to produce these chips. Um, so until that gets resolved, I don't know how much protection you can actually get from an investment standpoint. Um, I would say that this is, you know, I think it might last into next year with this talk, it will last into 2022. Um, but I think longer term, there's obviously a lot of investment going into chip production. Uh, TSMC spending something like 25 billion next year, and then Samsung spending a ridiculous amount over the next three years. And then obviously you have Intel coming back in as well uh, and setting up plants in the US. So I think there's definitely going to be a diversification of the supply chain for chips um, over the next sort of three to five years. Uh, the chip sort shortage, unfortunately, I don't really have a strategy to, to help you protect yourself from that, from the NVIDIA side um, or the AMD side, because I think this is something that all the large sort of fabless companies. So the uh, NVIDIA, for example, is fabless, right? It doesn't produce the chip. It doesn't manufacture the chips. It just designs them and, and, and sends the, the outsource, the manufacturing is outsourced to TSMC or, or to Samsung. Um, and at the moment, those two are really the only ones that have the technology to, to produce those chips at scale. Um, so I think for yourself, if you're not happy with holding them based on the chip shortage, then I don't think there's a, there's a way to, to, to get away from that. But if you are sort of bullish on chips or semiconductors and their trajectory over the next three, five, 10 years, then Obviously, NVIDIA, AMD, they're, they're all, you know, the top names in sort of gaming, AI, uh, data centers. So they're, um, I think they will be, they will be fine over the next sort of three, five years. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, the very last question is more towards CDN, such as Cloudflare, Fastly and all. Uh, I think right. this question is very uh, straightforward and simple. Do mm. you have any favorite stock for this i mean uh it's not really a recommendations for our attendees right today. It's my just personal take yeah. yeah sure so my personal take is um what i really like to see is a company continue to post um you know obviously the revenue numbers and the user growth and obviously the stickiness i think in that sense cloudflare has continued to deliver um fastly on the CDN side uh, has obviously disappointed. I think there are some really, um, you know, there are some technical reasons whether they, or there's some technical speculation whether they really have a moat. Uh, in that space, my preference would be Cloudflare. Um, I would not be a fan of Fastly. I don't think that's 
a company that's really got a moat maybe uh, in terms of its product offering. And you've kind of seen that come through in its numbers. Um, so whenever we talk about, you know, I think management likes to talk a game, right? They like to say, oh, this is a great product. And obviously they, they talk up their companies. It's awesome. This is awesome. And you have to say, that's fine, but show me the, you know, show me the numbers. Let me see what, what, if what you're saying is really true. Um, I think Cloudflare has kind of, you know, shown that. I don't actually own Cloudflare all fastly, um, but I, you know, I do follow that space. Uh, and Cloudflare has kind of delivered on, you know, the numbers, and you've kind of seen that reflected in its in its share price performance. And fastly, unfortunately, um, has not, and that's, you know, that's disappointed a lot of people. And you've kind of seen that again reflected in the share price. So I think it depends on, uh, it depends on finding the winner in the space, and you know sticking to the to the winner and the leader and i think in that space i think it's going to be cloudflare all right um yeah i mean before uh, we end this session there's very one last question that just popped in um so i'm just gonna post it with the five metrics that you just shared just now so mm. do you think that alibaba and tencent fulfills your five metrics over here i think it's a uh is, is that okay um I think Alibaba and Tencent, I mean, they're a bit more, I think SaaS tends to be a bit more the enterprise, so like a business to business, whereas I think, I mean, at least Tencent, I think is a bit more consumer. So it's business to consumer with WeChat and with, um, uh, you know, like, uh, you, you know, like Tempe or whatever, like WeChat Pay, it's a bit more consumer facing. Alibaba does have the cloud, but I think Alibaba on the cloud side is a bit more infrastructure as a service. So it, delivers the same kind of services as AWS or Azure. Um, and I think those two, to be honest, I mean, I, I, I did a Seedly webinar a few weeks ago. I think I was a bit more contrarian or I was a bit more against the what everyone was thinking about Chinese tech stocks um, or the tech giants. Uh, I, I'm not fully sold on whether they're you know, I think their best days may have been behind or maybe behind them now, just because of, I mean, besides the regulatory crackdown, their, their businesses are so big uh, and so dominant. Um, if you open them up to competition, there's obviously going to be, you know, falling profits, falling margins. I mean, that's what you would expect if you open a sector up to competition and, and the company has 99% or 90% market share, right? I mean, it's quite, it's quite natural for that to, to happen. So it depends on which markets are opened up. Um, but I think I wasn't negative on Chinese stocks. I just am more positive on other areas of Chinese stocks. So I think for Alibaba and Tencent, um, they're great businesses, but it also depends on where the government sees them fitting into, uh, you know, the, the Chinese economy. Are they going to be given the free reign that they have been over the past 10 years? I think the answer is clearly if they won't be. Um, and I think for profits, that won't be good, uh, medium term. Longer term, you know, there are questions over whether they have the international growth. I, I don't think Chinese stocks like Tencent or Baba have the international growth. So I find the better opportunities will be in sort of the mid cap space in Chinese tech, where there are gonna be companies, you know, they're already starting to sort of prove themselves in maybe enterprise level SaaS that are smaller, that have a massive domestic market to grow into and are not humongous, are not huge, like a Tencent or Baba already. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I guess I can't answer the question directly because I guess those two don't really fit the SaaS model, um, but I would answer it in that I find the opportunity set in China a lot more compelling outside of you know Tencent and Baba and JD and those names, yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much, Tim. Um, so um, all the attendees tonight, uh, that's all for Tim's session. So thank you so much. Have a good evening, Tim. Thanks. All right. That's, so let's uh, move on. So for those who join us uh, from the start until now, uh, again, as mentioned, you do stand a chance to win uh, Takashimaya vouchers or Grab vouchers if you are residing in Malaysia. So how do you do so? It's simple as this. So all you do is log in, um, key in your first name, last name, email address, 
you will receive an OTP via SMS or email. Then head over to game. And don't forget to click join game. So once you join the game, you stand a chance to score, upvote, put in questions, and that's where how you're gonna earn your vouchers over here. All right, thanks. Uh, moving on to the next slide. For those who join us slightly later, as mentioned, CJSMB is giving away a Tesla Model 3 and up to 36 Apple products. That is almost six products every month. So don't forget to scan this, register for Driven with us and stand a chance to win them. And for those who are not following our social media, do scan this code and follow us and you'll get insightful things and upcoming sessions. We may even talk about China markets since there are quite a fair bit of questions around it. And so that's all. Uh, Tim and I will just gonna sign off now. Thank you so much, everyone. Guys, thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.